And we are live. So welcome along, fellow time travelers and nomies. This is Scott Cardinal. This time around, we are going to kind of sort of travel back to New York City in the 1970s. And we're going to talk about the Son of Sam serial killer murders. Now, we've got a special guest with us today, I'm Manny Grossman. Did I say your last name right? You sure did, Scott. Thanks for having me. And hello to everybody out there in uh, Scott Cardinal land. I really appreciate the invite. And we're going to have an awesome time today. Very cool. Exactly. So everybody just sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of mead or a flagon filled with any beverage of your choice and join us around the campfire. So hopefully everybody is doing well this evening. We see the same usual names. So we're so happy to have people here. Thanks to all the mods. Really appreciate them as well. So everybody, what we're going to do, and, uh, and don't take this personally, but we are going to talk to you as if you know absolutely nothing, nothing about this. We are starting at ground zero. Uh, you're like, a, like an eight-year-old. Well, we wouldn't talk about this with an eight-year-old, but make believe you're an 18-year-old <laughs> and you know nothing. And so what we're going to do is kind of tell you who, what, where, when, why. And in another episode, we'll talk about how. Or maybe we'll talk about why in the next one, too. So uh, let's get rolling. So, Manny, we're, we're in New York City, and mm-hmm. it's the 1970s, right? Well, 1976 and 77, to be exact. Okay. The, the years of darkness, the years where New York City was burning, where everything was falling apart in the city. Uh, you, you know the deal. Taxi driver, you know, the, that whole dystopian uh, nightmare of the, of the mid-70s, the Bronx is burning type stuff. Exactly right. Exactly. So it was a weird time to be in New York, and the police were, weren't exactly the best staffed in the world either, were they? No, actually, it's funny that you say that, because that, that, um, that fact uh, escapes a lot of people's notice, that, that there was a huge fiscal crisis. The, the city was laying off municipal workers like crazy, including the cops. And uh, so NYPD was certainly understaffed in those years. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the one of the side effects of that was this criminal called David Berkowitz sliding in there and being able to do his thing pretty much undetected. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Tell us what's what happened there in 76. So uh, we're, we're not talking about Manhattan. I'm actually going to pull up a map because a lot of people, let me very quickly tell them what we're dealing with for people who aren't as familiar with the city as we are. So this is Manhattan right here. And this is when people think of New York City, this is what they think about. They think of the World Trade Center. They think of the Empire State Building. They think of the Dakota Apartments, the Plaza Hotel. They think of Central Park right there in the center. But New York isn't just Manhattan. You do have Brooklyn. You do have Queens. You have the Bronx. You actually have Long Island all the way out here. And you have New Jersey on the other side, but we're not talking about Jersey today. But so you've got this whole other area that um, where people live, and they are New Yorkers too, aren't they, Manny? Yeah. And in fact, that was one of the big things that fueled the terror of this whole spree was the fact that he was not going into Midtown Manhattan. Uh, Son of Sam David Berkowitz, I call him. I actually have a a few monikers for him. You'll hear me call him Lord of Life David Berkowitz because he loved lording over people. And and I also call him Disco Dave Berkowitz because he was known to frequent the discos in search of victims as well. And we'll get into that in a future episode. But he was stalking the neighborhoods of the essentially the working class, middle class, the white ethnics, if you will, uh, white working class. And also and, and so he was he was hitting these neighborhoods out in Queens and Brooklyn and in the Bronx that had never experienced anything like this. Yes, there were a lot of shootings going on in New York City at the time, but not in these neighborhoods. So that was one of the things that really fueled the fear. And it, and it became a huge fear campaign in New York City. Yeah, what a lot of people don't realize is when you look at Manhattan, uh, unless you're a New Yorker, you don't realize that it's neighborhoods. You know, we kind of mentally know Upper East Side, Upper West Side, Greenwich Village, Soho, Lower East Side. You know, we've got that in our mind. But once you go to the other verbs, once you start going into uh, the, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Queens and Brooklyn, the rest of it, you actually have real neighborhoods. Yes. I mean, where people have even houses, not just buildings, yep. and they're walking to their local supermarket and people know each other and it's a smaller community and they probably felt really safe there. And for the types of stuff that was going on, it must have freaked the hell out of people. Oh, absolutely. And it, and it and um, it's funny that you say that because, you know, one of the reasons I started my video series and I started this series a year and a half ago, 
I started it mainly to show the sights of the of the Son of Sam. Um, I felt like there had never been good visuals of any of these sites. So one of the things people said when they first started seeing the videos of the shooting sites in particular was how suburban it looked about. They couldn't believe it was New York City. It looked like, you know, the middle of, uh, you know, just any suburb of, of, of America. And, and they were absolutely right. This was a, a spree that hit the suburbs, really, even, even though it was the, a New York City, it was not Midtown Manhattan in any way, shape or form. Exactly. Um, so since uh, we're up and running right now, we sort of hit the ground running. At this point, why don't you just very quickly tell people who you are and how you got involved in this, and then we'll continue on. Where you left sure, out. sure. Well, it's a very long story. I could do 10 shows just on that, Scott, but we'll keep it very short. Well, my name is Manny Grossman, everybody. I grew up in the Bronx, in the Riverdale section of the Bronx, which is just south of Yonkers, New York. And of course, Yonkers, New York was where Disco Dave Berkowitz was eventually arrested. He lived in Yonkers, even though he was from the Bronx. He was from actually, if you look at this map that Scott has up here, he was from uh, the East Bronx. So if you go to the top there and you go to, correct, all the way actually, he was from, the, from oh, an area called Co-op City. Okay. Right. Which was right there on the Long Island Sound. And, um, and so he, but he was living in Yonkers at the time and uh at, when he did it so so th the son of sam case is a case much like manson much like all of these very zodiac much like all of these famous old serial killer cases that has a lot of well let's just say myth around it uh, uh we have the official story which we're going to talk to you about today uh we're, we have then a huge conspiracy theory that um that was started in about 1980 well really 1979 as soon after the arrest of satanic nationwide satanic cult involvement in son of sam and uh so i started actually in 1993 uh, becoming obsessed with the story because I was a local kid and I started to hear stories about Son of Sam hanging out at Untermeyer Park with satanic cults and this and that. And it just intrigued my mind. Like you, Scott, I, I mean, I don't, well, we just met tonight, but I'm, I have a feeling that you're, you, one of your fascinations are like old estates and, and abandoned places. Uh, and Yonkers, yeah. Yeah, Yonkers is filled with these places. So it, it just became like almost like a lifelong obsession with me. And in 2021, I was losing a lot of work and uh, I was in a lot of despair. A lot of, you know, you know, because of the lockdowns and what whatnot, a lot of us lost our livelihoods during that time period. And I had a lot of time and I needed something to do. So I started this video series where just to document the sights of the son of Sam and it morphed because it became so viral and so popular, but so quickly, it quickly morphed into an investigation and a crowdsourced investigation. I started meeting people in Yonkers who knew people and this person know that. And eventually I was working with law enforcement and we were getting deep, deep into the into the victims and and and, and, and the people that Berkowitz was terrorizing in his neighborhood. And it just became this sort of thing that took on a life of its own. And so people can check out my work if you go to True True Crime uh, with Manny Grossman. Um, and also I have a legacy video archive with over 300, almost 300 videos in it now, all documenting the, the progression from, I, I started this again as a Maury Terry acolyte. Maury Terry was the person who talked about the cult thesis. I believed in it 100%. Now I'm the world's biggest critic of Maury Terry, but that's a story for another show. Um, and I'll be adding the links uh, to your channel uh, below, as well as to our friend Eric, uh, whose show you were just on with Rob. Uh, just oh, a few thank days you. Ago, I think. Yeah. yeah, great show. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and jump on that. So the map that we have here, so what did you do when you're saying documented? Did you go there and take photographs or shoot some video? What no, what I did was I went out, uh, bought some equipment. Um, I had been inspired at the beginning of the of the pandemic. I was watching, you know, all these great uh, YouTubers do what was called the walk and talk. And I found it such a powerful medium, Scott, because it was just very simple and very effective. You just walked around, talked and showed the sights. And exactly. um, I right. I had been a, 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 an instructor at New York Botanical Gardens for 10 years at that point. And so I was very well versed in public speaking. I was good at it. I enjoyed the performance as the performative aspects of it. So it was just really a lot of sort of latent talents and interests that I had, they they came together in this video series. And, and it was all to document it with really good, high quality videography. Exactly. And so that's on which channel right now? Is that the True True Crime? True or? True True Crime with Manny Grossman. If you just type my name in, it's all my videos will come up. I, I have a I also have a gardening channel called Gardening Uncensored, because that's okay. actually what I do for a living. 
Oh, okay. So where do I find that? Let me. Uh, you you just, yeah, we'll just if you just type in gardening uncensored with Manny Grossman. I do gardening classes. Unfortunately, I was let go from NYBG, and uh, so I started my own gar okay. little gardening school. Very cool. Okay, well, I'm just adding both links right now, so they'll be down there within a, about a minute. So you Thank can you. I appreciate that, that as well Scott. for everybody. Okay, so awesome. So you got interested in it mainly because, well, no, you were interested in already if for years, but then during the whole uh, 2020 lockdown, you said, let me see if I could spend my time doing something like this. And you Correct. went ahead and did it. Yep. And awesome. it became huge. Okay. Right. Perfect. Okay. So your background is in landscape design. You were teaching mm -hmm. landscape design. So you're not a and, and horticulture. Officer, you're not and no. horticulture, exactly. And so this was something that was you you had an interest in because it was it was a local story. And you knew people that were affected by well, it in some way. Yeah, I mean, I uh, one of my main interests in, in life in general is just true crime. I mean, I and and also conspiracy theory. And 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 it's funny because true crime and conspiracy theory mixed on the Son of Sam case, and it's the it's the perfect case for somebody who who really it, it, or you're into rabbit holes, right? You're into the whole notion of satanic cults and nationwide and everything being connected. It's really a, a it was a fun thing. And, um, and so, yeah, so I was interested in, in true crime as well as, uh, as conspiracy theory. So I kind of wanted to mix the two and I ended up becoming a, a, the biggest proponent of the official story at the end of it all, which is very yeah. ironic. Yeah, that's gonna be really cool. Um, a yeah. lot more people, a lot, lot more people are joining us right now. So let me just very quickly say for those who are thinking they've missed a lot, what we've done so far is just establish the place. It takes place in Manhattan. I'm sorry, it doesn't take place in Manhattan. It takes place in New York, and we're showing that it did not take place in Manhattan. It took place in these other areas outside Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and we're gonna talk about that. And Manny just did an introduction of himself. And so now let's just go ahead and tell people because I see somebody here said they're 52 years old and they don't know the story at all. So if we if a 52 year old Manny doesn't yeah. know this story, then how in the world can we expect people in their 40s or 30s or 20s to know? So let's just go ahead and tell them. What, Correct. What, what, yeah. What and, and this is really a story that touched two generations the most, the boomer generation who were the victims and Generation X who came in right after, which I'm solidly in, born in 1973. Uh, we were the ones who kind of know this case and are obsessed with it the most. But, hey, it's always great to get the newbies in. So exactly. if you want to get that slideshow up, um, there it. we go. So here we go, guys. This is Disco David Berkowitz, the Lord of Life, son of Sam himself. And of course, this is um, an image, a still image from a recent video I just did with the guys from Westchester Drone Ops, where we went and did um, a drone video of his neighborhood uh, to show the perspective from his seventh floor, top floor window, lording out upon the neighborhood below. And this, this little sort of JPEG, GIF, whatever you call it, thumbnail that I put together actually does tell you the mindset of this guy. He loved lording over the city. He loved the control that he had in the palm of his hands, terrorizing the entire city of New York. And he really reveled in it um, for a year, which, which his crime spree lasted from July 29th to uh, 1976 to, to July 31st, 1977. So this is his Yonkers neighborhood right here. You see the building he lived in and this entire neighborhood right here, just this, this, this one section that I'm circling right here really contains the nucleus of the entire son of Sam story, but we'll get to that in another episode. So the son of Sam attacks begin when they begin on July 29th, 1976 with the murder of Donna Loria and the wounding of her friend, Jody Valenti. And these two were from the uh, Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. Again, white ethnics, Italians, working class. Her father was a bus operator. I'm not quite sure. They, they were Jody was training to be a nurse. They were coming back from a New Rochelle um, disco. New Rochelle is a town just north of the Bronx in Westchester. Like I'm on the, in, in the West Bronx right now. And Yonkers is above me. These girls were in the East Bronx and New Rochelle is the city above them. So they were in a, in a disco called Peachtree. And interestingly enough, and we'll get into this in another show, I just had the DJ from Peachtree on my on one of my shows on my live streams. And he told us straight up, yo, David Berkowitz was at the Peachtree in the weeks before the shooting of Donna Loria. He was there. 
Um, some people even said that witness that he was there the night that that she was there. So that's why we're calling him Disco Dave, because we feel that he was actually stalking these two. But in either and, case, I'm sorry, and people, Scott. And, and for people who don't know, the 1970s, that was disco in New York. Disco, disco <laughs> era. Yep. yep. Totally and so you found him everywhere. I mean, Saturday Night Fever, what was that, 77, whatever it is. And it was, and, and by 77, 78, whenever that movie was made, um, it was already sort of dying off. So, I mean, disco at this point, 76, you know, 77, whenever this was, uh, it was really, that was it. So, right. yeah, he was able to go there and blend right in. Right. And ironically, it was actually the son of Sam in part helped to kill off disco and the club scene in New York because of so many people were um, just stopped going out during that year. That they, uh, you know, that sort of the fad changed. And the next thing, of course, was new wave and punk rock. But that's another issue. But let's see. So so this story, of course, we think of Son of Sam as a media frenzy, as the city under grips of terror. And no doubt it was. However, we got to remember that until the fourth attack of there were about eight attacks until the fourth attack and the fifth attack. It actually wasn't clear that it was one person doing this. And so therefore, the city actually didn't start the frenzy that we know of Son of Sam really until April of 1977. So from July of 76, as we see here in this in this very, you know, pedestrian article chatting in a gar car girl met, met by death by James Duddy of the Daily News. This was actually the beginning of what became the Son of Sam spree. So we don't have to go through this entire article. It's it's really, you know, it's just telling the story as it is. But what I find interesting is David Berkowitz's re re um, recounting of it. I saw her and another girl sitting in a blue Oldsmobile Cutlass as I drove past. I parked about two very short blocks away on a side street. Co coincidentally, there was a space available. I left my car walking in the direction of their parked car. I saw both girls sitting there apparently talking. I circled the car at a distance like an animal stalking its prey. Cautiously, I was watching for the movement from other people in the street. However, there was none. Then from behind and on the sidewalk, I approached the car, took my revolver out of a paper bag and stopped parallel to their vehicle. I faced Donna, aimed my gun in the general direction and fired all five rounds very rapidly. I saw the glass breaking into small slivers. The horn started sounding loudly, and then I ran full speed in the direction of my car. I stopped running within 50 feet, and then I started walking briskly to it. I got in, and I drove off. I aroused no attention. I didn't know I had killed her until I read the post the following afternoon. The shooting took place about 1 a.m. I went straight home and went to bed. I got up early the next day to go to work at the cab company in the same neighborhood, Pelham Bay Park. I was at work promptly at 6.45 a.m. That day I made out better than usual in both tips and fares. I made it my point to go to work so I wouldn't arouse any suspicion. But who would have suspected me anyhow? I didn't know the victims. And that, of course, Scott, is what this was all about. These were random attacks. This guy didn't know these people. He might have been stalking them. Right. As we're as we're learning, but he didn't actually know them personally. And it was terrifying for people. So he he was a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. He lived in New York, as we say. And what was his career? What was his job? He was a cab driver. He had several uh, during the spree. He was a cab driver. He worked in a sheet metal factory. Um, you know, interestingly, he got that that job through his uncle who lived in Westchester, his uncle Leo. A lot of people said that, you know, Berkowitz was not connected socially to people. He had no friends yet. That's nothing could be further from the truth. This guy actually was very socially connected. But um, I forgot your original question, Scott. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I was wondering what he did, because if anybody was to consult me with a letter like that, because, you know, you want to read it 500 times and you're trying to find certain words, you're trying to find right. out some things. And I see things in uh, like a storytelling filter. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself that this guy is quite a daydreamer and he imagines himself to be something far and away different than what he actually is. So yes. I think reading this, I'd say this guy is, you know, blue collar, he's doing something that he just is just spends a lot of time fantasizing about being something that he is, that, that he's not. You because hit the nail on the head, Scott. And uh, yes, he was blue collar. So he was cab driving. He was working a sheet metal factory. And the job that he was doing um, when he was arrested was he was a mail sorter at the uh, at the post office in the Bronx, the main the main post office in the Bronx. 
when was he a postal worker at the same time? Was there an overlap or he just there was a, there was an overlap. And, and there's a, there's several articles in the old newspapers about um, how he would sit around, at, at, you know, at the in the USPS uh, lunchroom there and talking with his fellow co-workers about Son of Sam and saying this guy's got to be caught. And, you know, walking women and fellow co-worker, female fellow co-workers to their cars and so on and so forth. So there was a real dichotomy in, in David Berkowitz. Um, I actually have a, uh, a story from a local guy up in Yonkers that about a week or two before his arrest, his uncle got a letter on his car. His uncle lived in the same on the same street as, as Berkowitz, Pine Street. And it said, hey, I'm sorry, I, be- I dented your car. I feel really bad. Here's my number, David Berkowitz, right? So here's a guy who's worried, about, who has a conscience about denting a car. But then look at how he just coldly talks about first degree murder. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Um, Very quickly, why don't we mention his name and why he has that name? Uh, David Richard Berkowitz. Was that the name he was born with? No, David Richard Berkowitz was actually born Richard Falco. Uh, he was the product of an illegitimate, uh, of an affair, essentially. It, it, this is an interesting story in and of itself. We don't have time to get into it. But his mother, who's his real mother, his biological mother, whose name was Betty, uh, Betty Falco, originally Betty Broder, was was not married to Richard Falco at the time. He had already abandoned her. And she had taken up in an affair with a man named Richard Kleinman. Okay. And he actually, unbeknownst to me until fairly recently, it wasn't a one night stand. He actually was in her life for 30 years, Scott. And he would actually go to her house every day and then leave at night and go back to his real family. It was just this very strange thing. But he, let's just say, knocked her up to, you know, not just to use that term in a parked car in a, in a ironic that he went, the Berkowitz went out later and started stalking people in cars. Um, but yeah, so he was born, uh, in an illegitimate way and his mother gave him up for adoption to a couple named Nat and Pearl Berkowitz of the Bronx. Richard, Richie Falco was actually born in Brooklyn and at about three or four days old, his new parents, Nat and, and Pearl Berkowitz of the South Bronx, they picked him up and they took him home and, uh, you know, started that life with him there. Yeah. Well, you know, honestly, subconsciously, if he knew that he was a Saturday night special, if you will, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then that could be another motivation that he hated how he was born and the idea of a couple of a, a man and a woman uh, making out in the backseat of a car on a on at the night. He probably had a lot of frustration about people like that. Do you know why he chose? Because we're going to talk about that in a second, everybody. Uh, why why we're talking about him is because he was a, a murderer and he seems to have been interested in shooting men and women in cars and the women had to have what color hair well that's one of the that's actually one of the myths the two two things that you said are are actually one of the sort of the myths of of son of sam it 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 was mythologized and the official story was that he was going after women with brown hair but if you look at his victim list it's incidental um there were blondes in there there were light there were dirty blondes there were men there were men with long hair there were men with short hair you know so so both sexes were shot and it wasn't only it wasn't only um women with blonde hair but how but the media did portray it as such so of course all the women in new york even my mother all, they all short, shape, um cut their hair short and they all started wearing blonde wigs and all that kind of stuff um wow. and then of course the notion that he was shooting people in parked cars i think was sort of it, there, it did start that way and no doubt most of the incidents were in parked cars absolutely but there was also a, a shooting on the street where he just put a gun up to a woman's face we'll get it up we'll get to that in a few in a few minutes and just shot her point blank right in the mouth and there was also he shot girls on a, a stoop of their car of their house so um the media fan the flames with certain myths that uh, that you know still to this day people think but that th- that's for sure the two myths of the son of sam was the blonde hair the the, the brown hair thing and the and the parked car thing okay great All right so we've dispelled a couple of myths thank goodness because once upon a time uh people couldn't listen to people like us because we didn't exist or didn't have the power to speak and right. the media was able to drive the narrative. So before we get rolling with July 1976, which I believe was the first when he started getting mm-hmm. rolling as the son of Sam, I suppose, was he mm-hmm. a choir boy? Did he ever commit a crime before? Steal some gum? 
Did you ever do anything before that? Uh, it's funny that you say that because I have a weekly show, a, a show called Psychiatric Sunday, which deals just with Berkowitz's letter. He has about a thousand letters that he wrote to his psychiatrist after his in the in the years after his arrest. And Scott, he goes into great detail immense detail my friend about all the crimes he committed as a child he was um killing his parents bird he was uh, cutting people's roof antennas on the roof he was writing graffiti he was knocking paint cans over he was mm -hmm. i know this is the worst thing you've ever heard guys out there but he was crushing his friend's mother's matzah i heard about but, that that's but, bad. But when you start crushing matzah, you know there's trouble on the horizon. You're right. Actually, if you think about it, crushing matzah is really kind of a cruel act if you think about it. Because when you open a thing of matzah, I don't know about you, but I'm expecting a fully intact matzah. There's nothing Not, worse than it already being crushed ahead of time. Correct. Unless you wanted to make what's that name? Of, I don't. I'm half Jewish. I should know this. But cholent, it's like some dish with matzah, crushed matzah. Anyway. But he no, but he was a bad kid. He admitted uh, to numerous crimes, and he would and he lit fires, and he and he and he was cruel to animals and all sorts of stuff like that. Not Jeffrey Dahmer style cruel cruel to animals. His Berkowitz's crimes were more antisocial um, vandalism and, and arson. But he yeah. definitely was an incredibly prolific criminal. I don't think any day went by that he didn't do some sort of antisocial act. Uh-oh, we are being asked a very important question. If you're not able to answer this, I can perfectly understand. I don't want to put your, your back against the wall here, but we are being asked by several people what matzah is. Okay, so That's matzah, for, one, right? For, <laughs> yeah, for matzah, for those who don't know, is unleavened bread. It's a Jewish uh, thing that they use for Passover. It's essentially like um, crackers, like think of saltine crackers, but like a rabbi blesses it. So it's called matzah. And you can make matzah ball soup. Yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, I love matzo yes, ball soup. Somebody desperately wants to. So I think, and um, I don't know whether or not you expected this or not, but I think I might have to show a picture of matzo ball soup just to keep uh, some of the people Scott, here happy. Scott, do your thing. <laughs> we do not want people jumping ship and looking up. So there, everybody, that would be, if you're in desperate need of uh, matzo ball soup, it better look like that. It's got to have and a broth. Yeah, and send a, bo a box up to Dave Disco Dave for pre-crushing. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good <laughs> idea. All righty, we're back on track. I hope. All right, so, but so Berkowitz gets he he does this crime. He doesn't know the victims. He reads about it in the newspaper. Certainly getting off on that, by the way. And then a month, uh, and then a, so sort of another couple of months go by, and on October twenty third, nineteen seventy six, is the second attack. And in this attack, it's actually a male that gets shot. Now, to be fair, this male, whose name was Carl DeNaro, was sitting in the passenger seat of a car. And so the thought was that he was confused because of his long hair. He was confused for a female. And I think that everybody agrees that that's pretty much the case. Um, because Happens to me all the time. Yeah. Without getting shot at. Exactly. And, and, and uh, you know, Berkowitz... You know, he he was aiming for women. He wasn't necessarily aiming for men. But um, this is an interesting attack, again, because it took place in a very, very well to do neighborhood. Um, uh, uh, not exactly sure of the name of it. Um, was it Flushing, Queens? Flushing, okay. right. Yeah. Is it, it escaped right near Flushing? Uh, but in those near neighborhoods that have the huge right near Bound Park that have the huge houses. I was it was actually the first time I have ever been to that neighborhood when I, I did a video with Carl. Where, which you guys can see on my on my site where we walk to the his shooting site we walk from the site of the bar where he was at that night to his shooting site and he tells the whole story um but this attack um was again took place when there was no son of sam and um this attack actually so carl denaro just so everyone knows he's a big proponent of maury terry's cult theory he was very good friends with maury terry an author the, the main person who put forth the cult theory and carl doesn't actually believe that um berkowitz shot him uh so there's a whole controversy there which we'll get into in another show but according to david berkowitz it was very cut and dry the second job was the denaro keenan one both of them were sitting in a red Volkswagen and making out. This was my second murder attempt with my 44. I had approached the car from the rear of the car, walked up to the passenger side window and opened fire. I was more frightened than they were. 
Only one bullet struck the young man, and he really wasn't the intended target. I had fired with one hand and wildly. Boy, did I mess up. But really, I was very nervous. And so Carl, um, in my opinion, was unfortunately uh, led to believe that it was a woman that shot him in the whole cult theory. And the reason why was because of the wildness of the shooting. Uh, but recently, these letters were just released that Berkowitz wrote to his psychiatrist that addresses that in very stark fashion. It says right here that he shot a 44, which is a incredibly powerful gun with only one hand. So, of course, if you shoot a gun like that with one hand, your bullets are flying everywhere. So um, the yeah, I was reading I was reading that the bullets were deformed. What do they mean by that? Well, they they hit steel. They hit parts of the car and they and they got compressed and deformed and you know bullets are metal and when they hit something they're going to just get you know they're going to get slightly either slightly or very very deformed exactly. but this was another one of these attacks that kind of came and went there was no son of sam at that time so you know it just went in and out of the paper and carl denaro was unfortunately left for months wondering what who was this and what had happened to him it was a very it's actually quite a compelling story and i and i recommend that people look up carl denaro uh online and you and he he's very public and he and he does a lot of videos um he has done videos with me and as well and and you can hear his story firsthand Okay, so for those keeping track at home, the first one took place in Pelham Bay neighborhood of the Bronx. The second one takes place in Flushing, Queens. So you're not even dealing with the same police forces, are you? Well, you're dealing with the NYPD, but you're dealing with different precincts. And mm -hmm. um, it turns out that Berkowitz was a was an auxiliary policeman as a as a child, as a teenager as well as being a fire buff and uh and, and he was very well versed in having scanners and driving around the city um he also writes and we'll get into this in another show about how meticulously he planned these attacks and how um he had planned them for years in fact uh so so this was a guy who really put some thought into this and for sure he was he went from the bronx to queens and he ended up spending most of his time in Queens, actually shooting people there. But yes, he would do it in different precincts and different neighborhoods. And he definitely evaded the cops. It was a mistake that he was caught, actually. And we'll get into that at the end of this. Okay. So it's because of the thought that he put into this that he deserves the, uh, the moniker of serial killer versus mass shooter or just random killer because he really gave some serious thought to how he was going to pull this off. Correct. And not only that, but he was obsessed with killing. Yeah. We're going to see some examples of some writings that, that, that were found in his apartment um, a little later in, in this show that just are insane. And he wrote one of them on the day that he killed somebody. And we'll get to that in a, in a, in a in, that's the fifth attack. Okay. But before we get to five, we must hit three and four. So everybody, the third attack was, um, was it's, it's colloquial, colloquially known, excuse me, I messed that one up as the Lomino Damasi shooting. Joanne Lomino and Donna DeMasi. And these two were um, teenagers, 16, 17, uh, uh, maybe 18, not quite sure. But again, in um, 262nd Street in Queens, I, a middle village there, I think that's the name of the uh, of the of the neighborhood. Um, but very near to uh, Long Island and the Nassau County border. Um, but so they were, st they were, they had come back, they had watched a movie in the city and they were walking back to their house and they were, and they finally had reached the house of, um, I believe, uh, uh, Lomino, but don't quote me on that. I don't remember exactly whose house it was, but they both lived in the same neighborhood and they're standing on the stoop of their, of the house. And it's not really much of a stoop. I, I actually have a video of this shooting site as well. It's a very small house. It's like a bungalow with three steps that go up it. They, all of a sudden, the guy wearing an army jacket walks up to them. They're, they're a little freaked out. They're talking. All of a sudden, this guy's standing a few feet with them. He says, can you tell me how to get to? And then so they think he's about to ask for directions. And he pulls out a gun and he starts shooting them. OK, again, wildly. He didn't kill either one of them, but he did paralyze. Um, uh, jo uh, this what? I don't understand why I'm not. He paralyzed one of them, and I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it this, was Donna this was, Damasi. A, this was a technique that Ted Bundy had used, and some others as well. You just you disarm people by looking like you're just looking for help. You right? it kind of elevates their position, like oh, here's right. the person asking me, and so you lower your defenses. You're not so worried that they're coming over to you, like hey man, got five dollars. Of course, and to that point, Berkowitz. I mean, you're like I'm. I, 
did you do secret tons of research, Scott? Because to that point, he writes that very thing in his letters to his psychiatrist. He goes, I love my face because I look innocent and nobody will suspect that I'm the person doing this. So absolutely, man. I love doing interviews with people who are like with it and, and together, man. You're, you're I, will, I will make believe I did research. <laughs> yes, that's what I've been doing, man, for the last two days. Totally immersed in it. <laughs> yes, just say it. Yeah. So, uh, so for let's see what. No, by the way. Uh, so, uh, Long Island. For those who aren't familiar with New York, uh, there is a. If you're a New Yorker, you know what Long Island is. You know where what Queens is. But for the most part, if you look at it kind of on a map, there is like an overlap. There is kind of a blending, a sort of meshing, because where number three took place. For somebody who's, who doesn't know, because it did take place in this was in Nassau County. Right. No, it took place in it, within the confines of, of New York City, but it was very close to Nassau County. Yeah. Okay. Floral Park, it says. It was Floral there. Park. Yes. Within Not like Long 10 Island. blocks of Nassau County. Exactly. All right. So what was the thing you were wondering who was ended up being the paraplegic? It was her. Damasi? Yeah. So yeah. she was rendered. Uh, what happened is he was, well, Damasi was shot in the neck. Uh, the wound was not life threatening. Lamino, wait, hold on. Lamino was hit in the back and hospitalized in serious condition. She was ultimately rendered paraplegic. Lamino. Correct, and it was her house. Yeah. It was Lomino's house because it, it's kind of haunting. And when you when you watch my video on it, and it's up on my site, there's a um a wheelchair ramp that was clearly built afterwards for for Joanne Lomino. Yeah. And it's it's sad to to see that because you know why it's there. And and it's also kind of sad and poignant because you know that she never left that house after that. So, you know, a lot what a lot a lot of times in these crimes, we get so caught up in the perpetrator and the and the meta right stuff surrounding it. And in this case, it's the conspiracy and all that kind of stuff. We forget yeah. about the victims. Yeah. I'm guilty of it, too. Um, so, yeah. so let's see what Berkowitz had to say about this. Well, that was attack. the other reason why I wanted to do this show, because a lot of people just associate things with the murderer, like, like Charles Manson, right? Ted Bundy. And Correct. You, forget, you know, there's people that, that were the, um, you know, that really get, get forgotten in all of this, get lost in the shadow. It usually is, uh, um, very sadly, it usually is the victim. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's just the reality of it. So this is what Berkowitz had to say. The third shooting was the Lomino de Masi incident. This happened in November of 76. I saw the two girls on the porch of one of their homes. I drove my car around the corner, parked carefully and then went to the location. Again, I was nervous and I fired my gun with one hand. I shot wildly and poorly. However, this time I was able to read the full story in the headlines of the New York Post the following day. Naturally, I was disappointed that for all my trouble and risk, no deaths resulted. So you, you're seeing his mindset here, right? A sick guy who was pissed off that he didn't kill these people. Yeah. Um, and again, we're seeing that he shot wildly and poorly because he was using one hand, which is something that gets lost in, in translation with a lot of a lot of this. People don't realize that he had different mindsets when he committed each one of these crimes the early ones he was actually kind of unsure of himself and this is so, his job and he's trying to improve you know it's funny that you mentioned that because he did take this seriously as a job he really did he even calls them jobs mm -hmm. so here is the sketch that came out of the lomino de Masi shooting and of course it was these sketches that caused a lot of people to say, there's more than one shooter. There's a conspiracy behind this. This doesn't look anything like David Berkowitz. And in fact, there was a guy who we'll talk about um, in future episode called John Carr. He come, he'll play a huge role when we talk about the conspiracy. For many years, actually until fairly recently, I actually proved this conclusively that it could be Berkowitz. This was thought to be another person named John Carr who was one of the sons of Sam Carr, who will, again, we'll get into at the appropriate time in today's discussion. But this was one of the things that started fueling early thoughts of conspiracy in Son of Sam and that David Berkowitz wasn't the man. So the fourth attack was Christine Freund and John Deal. Now, interestingly, these, these people were older. So far, it's just been... Um, teenagers that were shot 20 year olds these people were, were were older 29 30 31 but again berkowitz didn't know any of these victims so it's not like he was choosing them for their age it was just it was just random people that happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time so the fourth attack is when things start coming into focus for nypd and before we get into that 
The fourth incident was in Forest Hills on January of 1977. It took place on January 30th, ex to be exact. This did result in a homicide to my joy at the time. However, this shooting was different than all the others for two reasons. One, because I used two hands to fire the gun. Two, because I didn't have any fear. This time when I crept up to the car and fired, I wasn't frightened and I remained calm and cautious. After the shooting, I ran to my car and escaped into the freezing night. The next day I heard about her death and the police theory that this recent shooting was connected to several others in the Bronx and Queens. Lastly, I cannot explain my change, a loss of fear, except for the fact that I was growing more cold blooded daily as my thoughts centered on murder and because my determination was increasing my frustrations were building. So just like you said, Scott, this guy thought of this as a job and he was getting better and better with it each time. Exactly. And full disclosure, I actually lived across the street from this. I lived in Forest Hills briefly. Beautiful. Oh, no area. kidding. Yeah, you yeah. know, these are the only two, this one, this, and there's a couple shooting sites that I haven't actually gone out to see, mainly because tolls on the freaking Queensboro Bridge, uh, all these bridges are so expensive. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, uh, I have to get out there. I've seen, of course, um, other shots and video of it, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very nice area. Again, another beautiful area of, of, of the suburban type of New York city that people don't think exists. So this is where it gets interesting. And this is where the frenzy begins, albeit hazily. Okay. Cause remember son of Sam was a frenzy. This was a media frenzy. Everybody in New York City was going nuts about Son of Sam in 1977, but it didn't start out that way. It took four attacks for the cops to realize, hey, there might be a connection here. So the Freud murder was the first attack that the police publicly announced that the attacks were similar to <coughs> earlier incidents. <coughs> and those earlier incidents, of course, we already discussed. It was first said publicly that a 44 caliber bullet was used. So that's very important to understand. They started calling this guy the 44 caliber killer. Not quite yet, but Son of Sam was originally known in New York City as the 44 caliber killer. How it was boring can you get? My goodness. You do not get more boring. If they, you know, listen, if they called me the, that, I would come up with a bunch of names also. I'd say, oh, listen, yeah. I mean, he, we're going to do well, something better than this. Well, it's funny that you say that because, again, he was the Lord of life. He had to dominate. He, he wasn't going to let anyone name him. He, he was going to name himself. And that's uh, you're on point, Scott. Well, the problem so, is, what if another killer comes out and he starts shooting people with a 44 caliber? So, like, what do you have? The, the 44 caliber killer of New York. Then you got the 44 caliber killer of Boston. Then you have the 44 caliber one of Kansas City. It's like, wait right. I'm just going to be got lost in the sh in the uh, in the mix here. <laughs> and well, interestingly enough, we we actually have a new theory. Me and my and and a guy, uh, a former detective that I'm working with, that Berkowitz actually has more bodies with different guns. But that's another that's another story for another show. Yeah. So, Cause, so cause I was going to say, for somebody who's taking this so seriously, the, um, there's only like one sh one um, killing here, one killing there. And it's like, if this guy is as obsessed with murder mm -hmm. as he is, why is he killing somebody in July? He doesn't get around to the next one till October. Then does another one in November. Does another one in January of the next year. Mm -hmm. and it's like, nah, it's probably something we're missing here. Well, if you want to be filled in on a little of the of the newest theories on that, um, I have an hour and a half long video on this very subject. It's called uh, Son of Sam and Zodiac, uh, Mike Lorenzo and new theories on Son of Sam. It's one of my most recent videos on there. It's actually the video for non-subscribers. If you go to my site, True True Crime with Manny Grossman on YouTube, that's the video that will intro. And I highly recommend people watch that because it's done from the perspective of a 20 year veteran detective, which, which, you know, uh, that that's the level that I'm working at now. Exactly. So well, I'll get out of your way. I know you have a lot to go through, but let's just click on the super chat really quick. Is there any real, uh, is there really any credence to the idea of Berkowitz didn't act alone? I know we want to talk about that in the future, but if you just want to very quickly address that, go right ahead. Well, there's definitely interesting circumstantial evidence that if you don't have enough context, <clears throat> right, you, you will definitely say to yourself, wow, he worked with other people. Absolutely. But when we break it down, and, and that's what my video series has been doing for the past year, when you break it down logically and you show all the errors that were made in that investigation, all the outright distortions, lies, manipulation <laughs> that was done, selective editing of the material uh, that was used, um, no, there, in my opinion at this point in time, there is absolutely no credence to the idea that Berkowitz didn't act alone. I am fully on board with the with the 
notion that Berkowitz was the only shooter in Son of Sam. And this is actually revolutionary, if you can believe it, that the official story is actually the true one, because we've just been going through this whole 40 year, really this whole 40 year nightmare vis-a-vis -vis Son of Sam and conspiracy theories. But again, another show. Exactly. All righty. I'm going to get out of your way because I know you got a lot to go through. So. Sure. So this was the first one where it was said publicly that the assailant was attacking young women with long brown hair. Again, a myth that ended up really, really causing a lot of problems in New York with with women. With, and well, hairdressers loved it. Hairstylists loved it. Got a lot of business. And at the time, NYPD were said they were seeking multiple suspects. And this was mainly because the sketches of the perpetrators were actually quite different from one another. And to this day, that's what the conspiracy theorists still hang their hat on to prove their point that there was a that there were more than one shooters. But any any policeman worth their salt will tell you that sketches are not really an accurate or a, a reliable way to uh, identify a perpetrator. So here's where it starts to get serious, uh, Scott Cardinal fans. And this is where it started to get really, really serious for New York City. Attack five, Virginia Voskarichian. So Virginia Voskarichian was a 19 year old uh, college student. She was a, a, a student at Columbia University. And again, she lived in Queens. <clears throat> just about a block away from the previous attack, the Christine Freund murder, it, th those two attacks took place literally within 100 feet of one another, which is very brazen on the on the part of Disco Dave Berkowitz. But Virginia Voskarichian was walking home, again, not in a car, not in a lover's lane, not making out with anybody. She was just walking home from the bus stop when Dave Berkowitz came up and, well, let's just put it this way, uh, 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 did something very, very wrong to her. He essentially put a gun in her mouth and shot her, shot her right in her head dead. And uh, we don't have to hear what, what, what I have to say about it. Let's just see what Disco Dave has to say. The fifth incident was also in Forest Hills. Brazenly, I traveled through that same neighborhood only a few weeks after the first shooting there. I spotted a girl walking up the street. She was pretty, slender, and dressed nicely. Without really looking about, because my eyes were focused directly on her only, I just pulled out my revolver from a plastic bag, and I shot her once in the face. I had no fear with the exception of being caught, and I was so transfixed on the shooting and my victim that I didn't notice my large plastic bag falling to the floor. I just left it there. I really didn't care. After the shooting, I drove straight home, and I watched the news on the 11 o'clock news. The next day, I purchased the Daily News, Post, and Times. I remember the headline, Second Killing Stuns Forest Hills. So this is where the, where, and this is, of course, a, a, a crime scene photo, uh, or maybe just a photo taken by a newspaper reporter, not quite sure. And it's a very sad photograph. It's them, the cops, investigating, and here we can see the remains of Virginia Voskarichian, who had been shot probably an hour earlier, her life snuffed out by this psychopath named David Berkowitz, uh, formerly known as Richard David Falco. Now, what's interesting is that we found a letter that had been hidden for many, many years. This letter was found in his apartment on the, uh, 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 on the night of the arrest, okay, along with a whole treasure trove of other letters as well. But this one stuck out to me as a son of Sam researcher. Why? Well, because he wrote it on the date of Virginia Voskarichian's murder, 3877. All day long, the devil dog has been yelling in pain. There is no ceasing. I begged the Wicker Street cult to leave me alone. I am their slave. Today, the demon has not stopped for a moment. How much blood does he want me to spill for him? OK, so this morning he writes that. And then by seven o'clock that evening, Virginia Voskarichian is dead. So um, what, is, what is that writing to? Is that a journal of his? Is that something that he sent off to the no, newspapers? These were just found in his apartment. He was just writing things in journals. Um, there's 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 dozens of these of these writings. And I've analyzed them like crazy on, on our on our video series. They're extremely interesting. Do you think and, he really thought? the way he wrote or do you think he anticipated the day when he would get caught and they would look at him like this is some erratic this is the ultimate debate within the son of sam community right now and i did a, a show on the, on this very topic this morning uh called psychiatric sunday an interlude looking back at david berkowitz's apartment writings 
I personally, and this is just my opinion, I believe that he was under in uh, in the throes of psychotic delusion here, and I really believe that he was writing these for real. That this was actually his mindset. That he was actually being driven crazy by barking dogs in his neighborhood, and it was and and because he had these issues with sound, misphonia, all these issues with people cracking gum and driving him nuts. He was going nuts in that apartment, Scott. And I, I personally believe that these were legit. That these, but some people think that these were feigned and faked in order to feign insanity. Um, well, how'd that work out? He pleaded guilty. He didn't even plead insanity. He pleaded guilty to everything and got sent to jail. So, yeah, um, I'm thinking he was motivated some way because as a writer, I'm offended by bad writing. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I read this. I'm like, oh, I could have done something better than that. So, but yeah, if he was really, well, let's get to the Son of Sam letters. Maybe you'll change your mind. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, but this is, this is where, where everything starts going. Absolutely ape shit in New York city attack six. And again, this is like this, th we have attack six, seven, and eight. There was only three left. The, 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 the frenzy in New York city did not last the entire shooting spree. It only lasted really from March, really April to august which is six months which is a long time but certainly not a, not the entire year but attack six was valentina suriani and alexander esau and this one is actually a personal one for me mainly because um my video series last year started attracting people who were friends of victims and we um were introduced to a gentleman by the name of gary Ma mcnerney who was best friends with Valentina Suriani growing up. And him and I walked around the old neighborhood. We walked around the area where she was shot. We went to her grave site and we did um, <clears throat> two very poignant videos on her, on her life and death. And so if anybody wants to watch those, you can go to my, my, my YouTube site. But this was the, um, the headline 44 caliber slayer. He was not known yet as the son of Sam. He would be after this one. Why? Well, we'll talk about that. The sixth incident was in the Bronx, a double murder of a young couple on the service road of the Hutchinson River Parkway. It was my best job. See, Scott, right? There's that word job. Yep. It was my best job because it resulted in two deaths. Plus, I left my first carefully concocted note on the scene. My shooting pattern improved greatly due to my fearlessness, which slowly developed and my two handed shooting method. Four shots were fired. Three hit the victims out of four fired. The man was hit twice in the head, the girl in the face, once in the face. Now I was making the papers nearly every day. The chase was on and the public was watching out for me. Right. So this guy was getting off on this. He loved he loved the attention. He loved being the center of attention. And one of the things he ensured that he would become the center of attention by doing was leaving this first carefully concocted note, which my friends became known as the Borelli letter. So let's take a look at the first son of Sam note. And of course, this was one of two letters that were sent. Well, this first one was sent to um, NYPD and it was not printed in the newspaper. The news, the newspaper only alluded to the fact that there was a letter left at the site, but they did not print the wording of this letter um, until after the arrest. And then so this was the first letter. And then we'll get to the Breslin letter next, um, which was written to a New York Daily News columnist, a very famous one by the name of Jimmy Breslin in the 70s. I am deeply hurt by you calling me a Weeman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. So here we go, Scott. Here's his first naming himself right here. I'm a little brat. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Behind our house, some rest, mostly young, raped and slaughtered. Their blood drained, just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic too. I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I'm on a different wavelength than everybody else. Program to kill. However, to stop me, you must kill me. Attention, all police. Shoot me first. Shoot to kill or else keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks. Too many heart attacks. Oog, me hoot. It it, sonny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in Our Lady's house, but I'll she her soon. 
I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt, my life, blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more. No, sir, no more, but I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to yahoos. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I want to wish you all a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next. And for now, I say good night and goodbye. Police, let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, 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 bang. Ugh. Yours in murder. Mr. Monster. And of course, the 44 caliber that he was using was a five shot gun. So we think that this was a clue right here to his gun that he was using. But this this letter, of course, was not printed. So it didn't send the city into into frenzy looking for clues. However, it did start giving the police their first crack in the case, because as any policeman will tell you, once they start writing to you, they want to get caught. It's only a matter of time. Uh, any questions, Scott? I'm just wondering, those uh, what you're reading from before, it said Daily News. So he did, he did interviews afterward? Because that wasn't from a confession, right? Who, wait, who did? Uh, earlier, when you were reading, when he talks about the killings, where does that come from? Where does that text These come are from? from letters that he wrote to his psychiatrist. Um, now, did, that were what year was that, or roughly? 19, 1979. Okay, so he's able to speak in great lucidity uh, mm -hmm. a few years later. Mm -hmm. But when he's writing these notes you think that that was his mindset at the time, right? Absolutely. You think that that's what, these are the thoughts when he's writing this, he believes everything that he's saying? I, I, I personally believe that he was in the throes of some psychotic delusions going nuts and, um, and yes, that he believed okay. what he was saying. And um, he was writing these, I, I've done extensive videos uh, showing how, because we have a ton of apartment letters mm -hmm. that were never printed. They only were released this past year. And in those apartment letters that, again, never were sent to anybody, they were just writing in journals. He uses tons of the same terminology that are in these very letters. Yeah. So he was just up there. Now, again, but it could go both ways, right? He could have been feigning this just to, to, to come up with a, with a, with a, um, like an insanity plea but if he was it was long thought out because he was writing these letters in his apartment going back to december 76 we have our earliest letter that we have dated from his apartment is december 22nd 1976 and he's going off about the blood monsters and the cult and this and that and the wicker street cult and these people you know so yeah. I think more research needs to be done, and I think you do bring up very valid a very valid question of whether these were really his mindset or whether he was faking this stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the human mind is incredibly complex, and you, no one has any idea what's going on in somebody else's mind. People could look normal and, and act normal, and you know, three seconds later, they're something else. So exactly, yeah, there's no way of knowing. I mean, we, you and I were talking beforehand. I, I was friendly with somebody who's bipolar and is something like just snaps. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? This isn't real, but they're convinced it is. And there's not Jack you can do about it. And exactly. So, yeah. No, I was just wondering uh, when that, when those interviews were, that's all. But um, yeah, no, I'm those were all sorts of ideas. Yeah, cool. No, those were letters that he wrote, that he wrote to his psychiatrist and there's tons and tons of them. So this was attack seven, Judy Placido and Sal Lupo, which again went back to Queens. The previous shooting, which took place on April 17th, 1977, was in the Bronx. But this was Judy Placido and Sal Lupo. And again, she was actually from the same neighborhood in the Bronx that these other women were shot. This the Pelham Bay neighborhood. She lived within a few blocks of the other victims, which then raises all sorts of, you know, thorny questions like did he stalk her did he, did he but that's again issues for another show but this took place at another disco and he was seen at this disco for sure and um and so he shot these two they had left the disco to go hang out in um uh, in a in a car uh a couple blocks away from the disco and you know probably doing what teenagers do in cars when all of a sudden their lives were just shattered. And again, let's see what he has to say about it. The seventh shooting was in Bayside, Queens. Two were wounded and I was angry. I don't see how that girl lived. Because again, Judy Placido, they both lived. The, the, there was no murders in this one. Again, I had no fear. 
I was alert and cautious. I ran to my car only as to quickly escape, and I cunningly traveled up 35th Avenue and not on the main road, Northern Boulevard. The shooting was very close to my sister's house. So he was actually, um, during this time period, uh, Scott, he was had reconnected with his uh, biological family, his, wow. bio, his mother, his real mother, and he was introduced to, the, to that, that family, and he actually became close with them. And he would stay at his, his mother's house. He would stay with his sisters. He met his nieces, his nieces who loved them. Again, getting back to your point, like, what was going on in this guy's head? And, yeah. you know, it's, these are these are interesting questions, which unfortunately this not the scope of today's show, but we certainly should be examining this stuff. Absolutely. And we should probably point out he's still a relatively young dude. Was he like 20, 22 years old, 23 years old? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Very young. And of course, right after this was when the Breslin letter was was uh, sent. And this was the one that was printed in the newspaper. And this was the one that sent all of New York City on a frenzy. And as you can see, there's one main difference um, between the, the previous letter and this one. And I'm just going to go back to the previous letter real quick. Look at the handwriting, right? It's, 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 it's getting there. It, it's looking almost architectural, right? Yeah. Ar like architectural drafting, but it's not quite there. However, this one was. And of course, this is what sends a lot of people into the conspiracy land. Oh, he didn't write the note. It's not in his handwriting. Uh, uh, actually, I proved that it not, not only is in his handwriting, but that he wrote this note as well. Um, so this was addressed to <clears throat> Daily News, of Mr. Breslin, again, very famous um, a, a columnist. And on the back of the envelope, it said, blood and family, darkness and death, absolute depravity. 44 with a with with a now famous son of sam symbol so this one um and everyone pretty much agrees and i'm actually curious as to your thoughts on this scott everyone agrees that by comparison this letter is a masterpiece compared to the previous one so let's just read it dear mr jimmy breslin hello from the gutters of nyc which are filled with dog manure vomit stale wine urine and blood Hello from the sewers of NYC, which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed on the dried blood of the dead that has seeped into these cracks. JB, I'm just dropping you a line to let you know that I appreciate your interest in those recent and horrendous 44 killings. And I also want to tell you that I read your column daily and I find it quite informative. Tell me, Jim. What will you have for July 29th? That's the anniversary of the, sh of the first shooting. You can forget about me if you like, because I don't care for publicity. However, you must not forget Donna Loria, and you cannot let the people forget her either. She was a very, very sweet girl, but Sam's a thirsty lad, and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. Mr. Breslin, sir, don't think that because you haven't heard from me for a while that I went to sleep. No, rather I'm still here like a spirit roaming the night. Thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work. Now the void has been filled. Perhaps we shall meet face to face someday, or perhaps I will be blown away by cops with smoking 38s. Whatever. If I shall be fortunate enough to meet you, you, I will tell you all about Sam, if you like, and I will introduce you to him. His name is Sam the Terrible. Not knowing what the future holds, I shall say farewell and I will see you at the next job. Or should I say you will see my handiwork at the next job? Remember, Miss Loria, thank you. In their blood and from the gutter, Sam's creation, 44. Here are some names to help you along. Forward them to the inspector for use by the NCIC. The Duke of Death, the Wicked King Wicker, the 22 Disciples of Hell, and John Wheaties, rapist and suffocator of young girls. JB, please inform all the detectives working the slayings to remain. P.S. JB, please inform the detectives working the case that I wish them the best of luck. Keep them digging. Drive on. Think positive. Get off your butts. Knock on coffins, etc. Upon my capture, I promise to buy all the guys working the case a new pair of shoes if I can get up the money. Son of Sam with his symbol. So what are your thoughts there? My thoughts are this. He copied this from another letter that he had already written because mm -hmm. he's not writing and thinking at the same time. 
there's no way because look how clearly uh, you know it's it's written. So he wrote it down. It looks to me, honestly, and believe me, I'm not comparing him to this in any way, shape, or form. I would not uh, insult these uh, great writers this way. But it looked to me like he was almost reading William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, uh, Lucian Carr, uh, right. Neil Cassidy. You know, uh, Ken Casey. It's like he was trying in the beginning. The first, the first couple of paragraphs. It looked like he was trying to create some because you know visual persuasion is the most powerful form of persuasion. Mm -hmm. And so he was in the beginning creating visual imagery, trying to describe New York, almost Henry Miller. Right. 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 And then he even and then he ends it that way also. So in the center, he's that's really where he's he's talking the way he really thinks. But in the beginning, it looks like he was trying to be. He's a lonely guy. Right. And he's a frustrated guy. And like you said, he's, he's blue collar, which I don't say that in a belittling way. I'm saying that he's obviously not some uh, advertising guy in Manhattan right. getting all dressed up. He doesn't have a wife, doesn't have a girlfriend. This is a guy who's living in a fantasy world and he imagines himself to be something that he's not something out of a movie. Look at the way I talk, look at the way I express himself. And so he probably read and says, look, I can write like this, too. I can talk like this, too. Look how I'll come across. He's imagining people reading what he's writing yeah so he's and, not just trying to say hey blah 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 blah. he wants people to really read it and pay attention to him yeah absolutely and i i could not agree with you more that was an excellent excellent analysis and one that i again agree with 100 percent he um he Actually, it's funny that you said that he had writ written this before, like he had prepared, because I have found in those apartment writings tons of the same terminology that ended up in this in this letter, almost as if he was drawing drafts of it beforehand. Yeah, which there's is no which way he's writing like this and thinking at the same right, time. Right, no right. So it's it's really really interesting that you say that, and I'm glad we're doing these shows with such a with with you because your mind on this is actually needed. You you may not realize that, but you you have a mind that I have now. Uh, uh, realized is actually needed to analyze this case. And I think that people of my fans in here who are in the chat will agree with me on that. All right. So the final attack, Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violante, and they're calling him 44 caliber, even though he was known as the son of Sam at this point. And there were, there were, you know, there were, th this was a really cheesy time period too, Scott, because people were, were making like son of Sam t-shirts, you know, like it was becoming like a, a, a they were selling things. It, there was, there were, um, the ballad of the 44 caliber killer was like a novelty tune that came out and, uh, you know, shot to number one with a bullet, you know, like that type of stuff was happening. And, um, but this was the final attack and, and this was the one where he, screwed up whether on purpose or not this is the one where he screwed up and got a parking ticket and got arrested but this was this took place in brooklyn and this one eluded dragnets because nobody thought it was going to happen in brooklyn south brooklyn in fact very far away from the other attacks uh but he went down to uh th this area down by the verrazano bridge and he found two people in a car making out and as you can see it's a blonde here right so not bl not brown haired women but these were the final victims robert violante and stacy moskowitz and this took place on july 31st 1977 with so unfortunately a year a year after he began a year almost to the day right um and this was unfortunately resulted in the death of uh, stacy moskowitz and the blinding of robert violante <clears throat> so this is what he had to say about it. And this, of course, he's writing in his own handwriting, which is interesting. I remember my last shooting in which Stacy Moskowitz was slain. I saw her and her boyfriend making out in the car. Then they left the car, walked over to the walk bridge and, and went along the path by the water. After about 20 minutes, they returned to the car, made out some more, then came to where I was by the swings. I watched Stacy on the swing and then she stopped swinging. Her and her date then started to kiss passionately for several minutes. At this time, I, too, was sexually aroused. I had an erection. Shortly after their deep kissing, they went back to their car. If my memory is correct, they made out a little more and then just sat inside their car talking. Now, I then quietly crept up alongside the car, but a little more to the rear. I had my gun out, aimed it at the middle of Stacy's head, and fired. One bullet struck her head and another nicked her. I didn't even know she was shot because she didn't say anything, nor did she move. Then I got in my car and drove off. And this is um, scenes of that. And I find I ch chose these photographs because they just 
you know, there's a there's a lot of photographs I have of the Brooklyn scene, but it's these two that I found the most poignant. There's just something very sad about this photograph, and I can't quite put my finger on it. But here's the car in which they were shot. You know, you you, you know now that the two people in it are in the hospital. This whole grimy thing of David Berkowitz shooting them and then driving back to his apartment in Yonkers. You know, it's just was a sad all around. And, you know, this this picture, I find, again, rather a rather powerful photograph um, of their of the 19, you know, 69 or 70 Buick Skylark um, that they were shot in. So this was the ticket, though, that Berkowitz got the night of that arrest. Now, some will uh, say, before, well, before, before, yeah, before you sure, go any sure. further, let's just point out to people that the Verrazano Bridge connects um, Brooklyn to staten island mm -hmm. and uh did you notice in that letter of course you noticed but i'm just saying to uh, in general mm -hmm. that um where's all the flowery language manny right it's very matter of fact i did this i did this i did this, yeah. I did this. with the exception of quietly crept up he doesn't have the ability to express himself in that flowery way anymore so right. clearly as an example that other one really was like an artistic uh expression for him and I here, think you're right. This is like, you know, here's what happened. I did this. I did this. I did this. I did that short sentences. Whereas how come he's not writing? You know, it's a it's a stormy night. And the right. Clouds right. We're moving. Right? right. There was nothing like that. You know, are, the, the scent in the air, you could feel, you know, there wasn't any of that. Right. Great observation and one that totally escaped escaped. And this is why I love working with people and doing this as with other people, because we need as many good minds on this as possible. Um. So he got a parking ticket that night and, you know, one could say, well, what the hell, how, how this is the elusive and dangerous son of Sam and he gets a parking ticket. Well, he writes in his letters again to a psychiatrist that he actually planned to get caught. He, he, he knew and he planned to get caught the entire time. Um, he writes that very starkly uh, in his letters. And so one could say that he did this on purpose. He got this parking ticket on purpose. He, he, of course the jury's still out. We don't know whether that's the case or not, but, but you know, if he wanted to get caught, what a great way to, to do it. He was an auxiliary cop in his, in his teenage years. He knew that they were going to investigate this ticket that what, that he got it. He, he got this ticket before the shooting and he chose to go and do the shooting anyway. Right. So yeah, that's so, interesting that he yeah, did that. It, it, it extremely interesting. And so it shows that that he was a person who I think was unraveling at this time and he was probably ready to end this and get caught. So so the cops did what they are going to do. After a couple of days, they re realized that they had this parking ticket and they started investigating. And what did they do? They called this woman right here. And this was what ended up starting really the the whole notion of the conspiracy in son of sam and we'll get into that in another episode but this was wheat car now who's wheat car everyone i'll tell you who wheat car was wheat car was the son was the daughter of francis car who was the wife of sam car sam car owned harvey the dog that you see right here okay so Sam, so Wheat was Sam's daughter and Harvey was the dog that was blamed for Berkowitz uh, doing the shooting spree. He said that a talking dog was ordering him to kill and it was Sam Carr's dog. That was a huge myth of the Son of Sam case. He, he never said that a talking dog, I mean, he did say it initially after the, the arrest, but it, that was not true. He, if you read his apartment writings, he was, he was just very, very, um, angry at the barking of the dog, but the dog wasn't telling him and ordering him to kill. Uh, that's a whole other story, but this was the dog that got blamed for Son of Sam right here. Berkowitz, where, does, where does the name like Wheat Car come from? That's, that's an interesting uh, uh, question, and I don't know the answer to it. Her full name was Wheat Micheline Carr, and she actually went by Mickey, uh, uh, just like my real name is Luis, yeah. but my middle name is Manuel, and I go by Manny. She she went by her middle name, and um, but Wheat 
again, don't know why she was named that. It is it is an unusual name, but I was, uh, I was anticipating the chat saying, "What's he saying? Why? What's he?" <laughs> no, but the, but is. but this is Harvey, the, the 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 talking dog, right? This is the famous dog, and and Wheat Car was the police dispatcher. So this is what started people really getting into the conspiracy talk, which will which we'll deal with again on another episode. She was the one that answered the phone in her job as the police dispatcher for the Yonkers Police Department. She was the one who had answered the phone from the police uh, from NYPD inquiring about the parking ticket. It just so happened that Berkowitz wasn't just doing the Son of Sam crimes in New York City, but for since December of 1976. No, actually, so since May of 1976, before the Son of Sam spree started. He was actually terrorizing the neighbors in his in his Yonkers neighborhood. It started on May 13th, 1976, one month before his shooting of Donna Loria. He threw a Molotov cocktail at the house at 18 Wicker Street. And that Molotov cocktail set off a chain, a neighborhood terror spree where Berkowitz started um, terrorizing the Netto family of 18 Wicker Street. And he started terrorizing the Carr family of 316 Warburton Avenue, both homes that he could see lording over his neighborhood. If you look at my drone video, I show you all that in, in stark detail. So she just happens to be the person being harassed by David Berkowitz. She already knows David Berkowitz as son of Sam because of the work that the Yonkers cops were doing. They had already suspected it for a couple of weeks by that point. And she's the one that ends up coincidentally taking the call from NYPD where they inquire about David Berkowitz. So it was this weird confluence of, of coincidence that occurred up in Yonkers that caused people to then say she was involved. They were involved. But we'll get into that another time. So here's her. Here's her father, Sam Carr, who let's just put it this way. David Berkowitz, Disco Dave, the Lord of Life. He hated this guy right here. He thought that this guy was the devil of Satan. He thought that this guy was sent from the forces of hell and it was his master to go out and shoot. I mean, the things that he wrote about this guy were appalling. And um, this is just him with Harvey, right? So the Carr family got a lot of attention after after the arrest because of the harassment and because of um, the fact that it was Wheat Carr that that fingered him to to the Yonkers police, and so subsequently NYPD. I mean, I'm sorry, NYPD. Subsequently, NYPD came up to Yonkers, staked out his apartment, and arrested David Berkowitz on August 10th, 1977. And booked him, and you can see his mugshot here, a very famous mugshot. And, uh, and of course, here's his mugshot now because he is still serving six consecutive life sentences. He will never be released from prison, um, and he's serving his time up in upstate New York. And, of course, then after his arrest, well, the mythology started, Scott. <clears throat> the talking dog story, right? The writings on the wall, all the crazy writings on the wall, the topsy turvy apartment. Um, I actually have a fireman who said that he was in a, in Berkowitz's apartment a few days before the arrest. And it was totally pristine with no writing on the wall. So you get into weird issues there and it gets back to maybe your point was like, did he fake all this stuff? And the, and the jury is out on that as well. But I personally think that he set up his apartment to look like this as a ruse. That's my personal thought. And you can see here his, you know, his kind of gross apart looking apartment. And then of course the famous writing on the wall, which if you look at it in this picture really doesn't have much impact, <laughs> right? It's not like the writing that we think it was. It's like this small thing, kill for Sam Carr, Sam Carr, my master. He actually writes how he got the idea for doing this from a true crime magazine uh, about the lipstick killer, William Hirons, who wrote the similar things on the wall in, in red. And here's the famous, hi, my name is Mr. Williams and I live in this hole. I have several children uh, and so on and so forth. So this started the whole mythology of crazy David Berkowitz and his apartment up there being ordered to kill by a talking dog. So the photos you showed aren't Sam. Right, there were Harvey. Is that right? This is Sam right here. Yeah. Okay. That's Sam. Um, and uh, and by all accounts, a good boy. Based on our uh, our super chat here by Leslie, dog behaviorist here looks like a good boy. 
They talk to me, but never do that. Uh oh. <laughs> well, Harvey, Harvey, the the dog was uh, apparently loved by this family when he he was actually shot by David Berkowitz um, oh, in geez. in April of 1977. Again, six months before the arrest, he was yeah. shooting dogs in the neighborhood. This is a whole other story that that is is worth that actually we have looked into extensively on my video series, uh, his his neighborhood crimes and why he wasn't arrested for them. But uh, that's Sam. And of course, the uh, the writings on the wall led to the mythology and the mythology that most people know of Son of Sam. And here's his car the night of the arrest. And it's kind of, you know, kind of gross looking car here. Kind of, you know, um, is is, of course, David Berkowitz ordered to kill by the talking dog. So his 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 um, apartment is a mess. Mm -hmm. His car is a mess. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you ever read? So his life is chaotic, right? Right. And so what he's trying to do in the back of his mind anyway, subconsciously, is try to find some kind of order in his life. And he's doing that through murder because yeah. he, he has no control over really his finances. Like I said, he's not the most stable guy financially no. in the world. He doesn't have a stable home life. He doesn't have a stable family life. He doesn't have a stable really even history. And so in his desperate quest to find some kind of stability, that's why sometimes when you when people are arguing, you might notice that rather than staring at you or, or throwing, sometimes they'll turn and like start um, straightening things out around. Right. Uh, they'll start straightening out the sofa. They'll start moving right. pillows around. They'll start doing something in the kitchen. Just in the back of their mind, they're trying to have some kind of control over something. They don't know where the conversation's going. They don't know what's going on with the argument. They don't know what's happening. Where this is, what, but, but they have some kind of control. Where and you see him, where control. you see that often. I'm sorry to interrupt. Where you That's see right. that often is where you see that quite often is in interrogation videos. Um, you know, people just try to order things when the mm -hmm. cops leave the room. They just try to order things on the. You know, but I'm sorry, I cut you off on your last. No, sentence. no, no. That's it. So, what do you think about this writing here? We can talk about it on another episode. But do you think like the letters that these were written? straight out of his mind, stream of consciousness, or do you think he was in was in preparation for the day that they're going to come here? It's really, really hard to say. And while I, whereas I have my opinion that this was his mindset and this was his, his psych psychopathy, it, you can make the argument as well that this was freshly done and done in anticipation. So <clears throat> I'm really kind of lost on this aspect of this, of the case. I, I, I don't know what to think about his apartment, to be honest. And, and it's one of the things that I'm struggling with still. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's his the famous 44 caliber gun and of course taking us out to the end of our of our show today enter maury terry okay so maury terry was a local guy from yonkers and here you see him on the aqueduct trail there's a there's berkowitz's apartment right there and the car house is right over here and if you guys watch a, a lot of my videos i'm right there on that same area so i show you what this looks like in the modern era and Maury Terry was a writer for IBM. He worked for IBM and he was also local to Yonkers. And he he grew up in the same neighborhood that all this kind of took place in. So he kind of got fascinated with the Son of Sam story as it was happening. And then after the arrest, he, well, I'll just put it this way. He made the mistake of doing a little bit of research and he opened up the phone book and he found an entry for a John Wheat car okay john wheat car now remember there was a wheat car here right which we're mm -hmm. seeing here she's wheat car and in the breslin letter which we see here there was the name john wheaties right so maury terry took those two uh, uh, uh thing um i'm gonna say coincidences or or facts or whatever you want to say he took those two things the the john wheat car um entry in the phone book and the john wheaties uh um uh name in the breslin letter and maury terry then started to ask around and by the end of it he had concocted a a theory of international cult conspiracy and the son of Sam with multiple shooters and Berkowitz being ordered uh, to kill by a cult called the process that was connected to Charles Manson. And there was a victim from North Dakota and all this stuff and multiple shooters. And uh, 
And so this, my friends, is where we're going to end off our discussion today. And if Scott is gracious, gracious enough to have me back, which I hope he is, we will take up the next episode discussing more Maury Terry's ultimate evil thesis. Yeah, that was great. I think uh, this is something that needed to be done, just laying the foundation. So once again, New York City, between night the summer of 1976 to the summer of 1977, and how many people is he officially um, being accused of shooting? Uh, well, there were eight incidents, uh, 13 victims, and six deaths. Got it. And once again, I'm going to pull up the map just to remind people once again of the area where this all took place. And so this gives you a an understanding of his operation. And he was, like I said, um, in different precincts. And so it must have been kind of chaotic, especially in the beginning, until he actually drew attention to himself as being the son of Sam. You know, who knows? Just some random shootings. Right. Now, sooner or later, they probably would have pieced it together as it made the news. Or would it not have even made the news? Who knows? Uh, what was the shooting? What was 1970s? A lot uh, of New killings York. in New York. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was no, that wasn't exactly Savannah, Georgia. Right. 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 No, and, he wanted to be known. Yeah. And as far as wanting to be caught, that's an interesting thing to discuss because you use an example maybe as the murder of John Lennon, where he shot John Lennon and then he stayed there. Right. He took his coat off, actually. Took his coat off. Right. Started reading. It and started reading. Yeah, exactly. Um, Catcher in the Rye. And yeah. waited for the police to arrive. And so you look at somebody like uh, Mr. Berkowitz, and he had really nothing else going for him. This was his big uh, lead up. This was his, his job. Yeah. He, his fact, job he said, and, his, and his job was to get caught. Yeah. And he said that he had been chosen from birth to do this. He was very serious about this. And when, let me tell you something, when Disco Dave, the Lord of Life, put his mind to something, it was going to get done. Yeah, exactly right. So thank you all for your research. We appreciate it. And uh, Leslie, once again, he unalived the dogs versus killing the dogs. Okay, well, why not? I, instead of saying stealing, I usually use the word liberated. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always awful when you find out that serial killers uh, tortured and harmed animals. That's just, I mean, torturing and, and harming anybody is awful. That's how they know. start quite often. Yeah, well, I guess it desensitizes them in right. many ways in preparation. Right. So, right. All right, everybody. So thank you very much for joining us. We try to uh, stick to a certain time period and to go through what we did in order to lay the foundation. So very well done, Manny. I'm sure everybody appreciates that. Thank you. So, so everybody go ahead and click on the links below and you will see Manny's links uh, to his YouTube channels. Please sign up as quickly as you can and watch his videos and like them and share them. And uh, hello, clever nickname. You two complement each other very well. Yes, the accents. Manny, <laughs> the, can you say Worcestershire Worcestershire sauce? Worcestershire. Worcestershire sauce. It's not the easiest word. If we took the word sauce out of it, it's easier, right? <laughs> Worcestershire Worc sauce. Actually, I'm okay with that with that word. I'm, I'm, I'm decent at saying that one. Okay. How about draw? Like opening up a draw? Dr well, actually, I say it with the Boston accent because I just find it funnier. So I always say dra, and dra. I've just okay. said it for so many years as dra that I just say it as dra. But if I'm going to say it, I'll say draw, draw, draw. Yeah. Somebody once accused me of not being a New Yorker because they asked me, they were asking me questions about bus transfers. And let me tell you something. I was born in New York City. I've never been on a bus in my life. Who the hell is really? going on a bus in Manhattan? Well, in you're Manhattan, not, you're in right. Manhattan. There's no. I never understood buses in Manhattan for the life of me. Just take a freaking subway. Exactly. But, uh, but I lived on the buses. Anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Growing up in the North Bronx, I lived on the buses, and um, yeah. Listen, this was this is a, a a city of neighborhoods, and every neighborhood has their its own regional accent. So even though I grew up in the Bronx, I sound very different from David Berkowitz, who grew up on the other side of the Bronx. And that's that's what makes it, you know, so, so one of the things that made it an interesting place to live. Of course, now New York City, I don't even want to go into it. No, they've destroyed it. it destroyed uh, politicians it. Politicians have destroyed the Gone. beautiful city. Yeah, Gone. It's, it's terrible. But I think a lot of people don't realize that, that yes, there are individual neighborhoods and people in Manhattan talk different than people in Queens, people in Queens. And, and you're talking about, you could stand at the you could stand on the East River and throw a rock and hit Queens, but 
it's a totally different world. Completely world, different, different world. Neighborhoods. Right. And and so, yeah, exactly. Now, maybe if you're, you know, some 27-year-old lady in Australia, we all sound alike. Every American maybe mm -hmm. sounds alike. But, yeah, we could distinguish the difference, especially New Yorkers. So, all right, everybody. So thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about Manny, please click on his channel, click on his videos and watch them. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Kindly give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I've written a whole bunch of books about the Dakota, Friar Park, the Ansonia, a lot of architecture stuff. If that doesn't bore you to death, go to Amazon, type up Scott Cardinal and see what happens. Um, I think I'm the only one, but who the hell knows? Anyway, I've got a sponsor called Treat Yourself Shop. If you like nutraceuticals, that's the place for you. So until next time, everybody, uh, Manny and I wish you safe travels on all your journeys. So good night. Ready? All right, hang tight, Manny.